It could have been so complicated. Could have been so complicated. Super public, coming out of a divorce, kids involved. There's so many lanes there where it could have been met a lot of resistance. Zero. The station that the show was on thought it would be a good idea to announce that we were coming. The day we were coming, the flight we were going to be on, the whole thing, 15,000 people showed up at the airport. The whole airport was shut down. So something happened at age seven that made you feel abandoned by dad. Is this resonating? Yeah. If you want to share it? I've never spoken about this stuff. He would tell me that I was a uh, pathetic waste of space that would never amount to anything. Uh, ever since I wrote my goals down with the pen, my dreams and reality have both been blending in. I just hope that in the end, my dad don't extend me on my dividends. If it did, I'd have to keep pivoting. Turn the other chicken down another dose of adrenaline. I don't need to pretend to live a life that I never did. Cause I'm right my dear listeners, today's interview with Sharna Burgess and Brian Austin Green is so incredibly beautiful. I cannot wait to share it with you. Brian Austin Green is primarily known for his iconic role in 90210, and Sharna is a ballroom dancer and choreographer who's become a world champion and a fan favorite on Dancing with the Stars. In this episode, we talk about the importance of timing when they met, co-parenting their youngest children with Brian's ex-wife, Megan Fox, the debilitating health challenges that Brian has faced, Sharna's intrusive thoughts after childbirth and so much more. In fact, at one point, I do an impromptu energy healing for them and you might be shocked by what comes up. I'm also giving away two books that Sharna and Brian recommended in this episode, so make sure to listen close because I'm gonna explain at some point in this episode how you can win. Okay. <laughs> a little Michael Jackson Mom life. accent. Yeah, right. 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 At least she's not wearing a sparkly glove. That's that's a hard one to explain. I have worn. Did you know? I have. It was one of my first shoots at ABC about ten years ago, eleven years ago. Michael Jackson had died. He'd been, I think, dead for a year at this point. They're doing mm-hmm. a, a, an anniversary special of like his whole life. It was for twenty twenty, and I did an interview with his costume designer of his basically whole career. And he brought me the glove. Like, there's, I think, two or three of them in existence. And Very he brought cool. me one, and I got to wear it. Very Pretty amazing. Cool. Very yeah. cool. crazy. That's really amazing. That's I was like a 19. huge honor. Huge, yeah. right? Huge. Yeah. Why do you think it is that? I mean, this may be too serious, and you can let me know. But you know, there's, <laughs> it just, I actually thought Never about it recently. Serious. So now that we, now that we brought it up, maybe this is why it came to me a few days ago. I'm, I'm walking at. Uh, it was like Air One in Studio City, mm-hmm. and Michael Jackson came on, and I thought it's interesting how. Now, we're in a culture where people can get canceled so quickly, any little thing, before it's even... And it makes sense, I guess, from a brand perspective, where they're like, before people we... People want, want to I'm just going to cut this contract before right. anything happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why do, you, why do we think with Michael, for example, with the documentary comes out, all these things, that it's kind of never been... Like, his, it's still okay, you listen to his music, it's out there, it's been unscathed, sort of. I think I don't think it's totally unscathed. I mm. think a lot of people did cancel him, but I think um, there are so many people that don't believe the documentary. It's a topic of mm. of debate. I yeah. mean, we we have the conversation between the two of us we of recently had a Michael Jackson and How exactly that situation. Um, uh, there's there's so much because there's such limited information out there about it. Um, it's really in a place kind of where it's up to people to, I think, take their own sort of opinion of it and take the, that's how I feel. I don't think that it's you limited feel information. I think people have come forward and told their story, <laughs> but people don't want to believe that someone they idolize and is no longer here to defend themselves could possibly have done something like that. And a lot of the time, as humans, we didn't, you know, the things that hurt the most or that we can't, you know, process, we deny, right? So I think when it comes to Michael Jackson, he influenced so many. He was one of the greatest impacts on music, on dance, on culture, on people. You know, you watch his concerts. People don't react like that anymore uh, at concerts. It's like it's, seeing the Pope. Oh, my yeah. God. It's I, like saw, seeing, you know, I saw Christ him in like concert that. in Hawaii one time, and it was pouring rain. His concert started. The rain stopped for the whole show and literally last song as he was playing off the rain started again yeah, I mean, and I was talking to one of his uh, roadies like one of the people that does the show and he was like he said to me he was like you have no idea how often that happens like wow. we'll be in Germany like dumping snow pouring rain all sorts of stuff and 
literally at those it, it was the cra- it was one of the craziest experiences for me yeah so that's interesting crazy. to witness yeah that is but i i don't fully think that he's unscathed there are radio stations that won't play him there are people that i oh. i hear you know around me when michael jackson comes on and it's sort of this like oh, i can't believe they still play him but you mm. know he is no longer around to defend himself and that timing of that documentary and all of that i think for people were like why are you going to go and do this now that the man is dead? Yeah, I heard so a lot of that too. It's an yeah. easy way for people to be disregard. I right. don't, I don't count this as valid. Um, whereas, you know, there are other artists today, like T- well, R. Kelly is a whole. Ooh, the, that was a whole, was a whole thing. different thing. R. Kelly is a whole different con- yeah. conversation. Yeah. conversation. I, I shouldn't put that yeah. in the same. Way. I mean, you know. <laughs> We don't need any more information on that one. Like, yeah. we have tapes to show. Uh, other right. people that are cancelled for a lot less, like, say, tweets from 20 years ago. Yes, yeah, They're yeah, 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 still yeah, yeah, here, yeah. So yeah. people can look at them and and see how they're reacting or judge their mm. response to things. Where Are they sorry? Are they not? They, they should be begging forgiveness. They shouldn't say sorry. Everyone has an opinion. If those people, I think, are still around to be a part of that conversation, then it keeps it sort of the fire lit. Whereas mm. Michael Jackson, people want to believe he was an icon, he was a god, he was right. a whatever. Right. Let's let him rest in peace. Right. Well, it's right. interesting too, the concert story, because right? I did a YouTube video years ago and it was, and it got like millions and millions of views. And it was basically, I met this woman who was on Ghost Hunters. She was like a medium, right? And she would do uh, seances. So I said, mm-hmm. why don't we do one with one of the biggest Michael Jackson impersonators in the world? Looks like splitting image. We'll bring him. Um, who actually he owns some of his things, you know, that he's bought on auction. So I'm like, we'll bring those things, establish a connection. And we did this thing where we do a seance. Whether it was real or not, I don't know. I still don't even have like that firm of an opinion of it. It was a unique, cool experience. He came through, she starts talking as though she's him. But what was interesting that I noticed is I have, you know, 1,200 maybe songs on my playlist. Mm -hmm. Three or four are Michael Jackson songs. That week leading up to that shoot, Every single time I got in the car, every time I turned on my phone, I went to the gym, it was a Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson. It was not the day the shoot was done. It was like you said, the day the shoot was done, it never happened again. Really? Never happened again. So crazy. I mean, there's something about that. There's something in that. That's the part of when I say that I'm I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. That's the spiritual side that you can't explain. Those are the things where it's like talking about paths and talking about, you know, people morally being in certain areas and, and connecting when they do. And, um, we had all these, uh, instances between the two of us where we could have met each other and never did, but thank God, because we weren't ready for, yeah, at the time. It for wouldn't have happened. what we have yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and honestly, we would have most likely messed it up anyway if yeah. it mm. happened at that point um there was divine timing involved so those are those things where you have to kind of sit back and go okay i there is no science behind it like there's there's no firm answers to it but i just feel it just feels right so i'm just going to continue to uh believe it and and enjoy mm. the experience of it isn't it interesting how like you can know that too like if we met at that time it wouldn't have worked what do you think the well first of all how did you actually end up meeting meeting <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> you tell the story. Um, so we were, we have the same business. And then I'll correct it if you mess it up. <laughs> um, we yeah we have the same business manager. Her name is Laurie. She's really awesome. And she's been with Bri for over twenty years. With yeah. me for mm, seven, maybe a little more. Um, she spoke to me one day, and she was like, "Hey, there's this." person that I really want you to meet, this guy I really want you to meet. And it could be a date or it could be a work thing. Mm. We're going to, you know, we'll set something up if you're open to it. Uh, And he's about to do this show that has dance in it. We could, you know, say that it could be about that. And if you like it, then you can see him again. Uh, I was like, okay, cool. You know, who is it? She said, oh, Brian Austin Green. And I was like, cool, who's that? No. <laughs> and then when she was like, oh, you know, he did 90210. And then I, you know, looked him up. I was like, oh, I know this guy. I remember his face for sure. I said, yeah. I mean, it's such an odd request to have come from her. Mm-hmm. She's amazing. When she's not a matchmaker she's type. Not a keyboard, uh, you know? She is very like business. Yeah. And she, she does that. And so. she's 
wonderful and like we're friends in that sense but never have I had a request like that so it was it was so out of the box that I was like yeah let's let's do it then and at um, this point though let me interrupt so Brian at this point does is she telling you as well that she's matchmaking you or is no she, so or did she, you ask for it so okay. she came over I had to sign some papers one day so she came over and I made coffee and we were just sitting and talking and then she called me um on my cell after later, she left, right? After she left, and she was like, hey, I've got another client that uh, I think you should meet. I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, that's, again, odd request from her. She's yeah. not, she's just not that type. I've never, I've never thought like, oh, matchmaking advice, I need to go talk to Lori and see what <laughs> she thinks. You know, um, tax advice, she's absolutely <laughs> the right person. Yeah. Um, she's the best. <laughs> so, uh so we we ended up she connected us we were texting it was sort of a group text thing with um, her for a second with her for a second and then i asked her to kindly step away <laughs> and she did um and and we went and had uh coffee our first date and we ended up talking for like four and a half five hours wow. which um i hadn't experienced before uh, you know it's there was Absolutely, of course, physical attraction there for me, but it wasn't about that. It was really about like we just had such great conversation and, and uh, we seemed to be so aligned in so many ways just in life and what we had experienced and what had, what had brought us to the place where we were at that point. That's what I was saying about when we were talking about if we would have met um, the numerous times that there was sort of an opportunity to years before it most likely wouldn't have worked because I don't think either one of us were really in the space that we were in at the point when we did meet. And when we met, we were just in a place of like, I, I'm not necessarily looking to date. I'm not against it, but I've, I'm so good with my life and what's going on. And I'm, I've been working on myself and I feel so confident about who I am now. And I'm so happy and content with, where my life is mm. and Sharna was the same way so at that point then it it was like oh so then let's just hang out and kind of do this together since we're both sort of in the same space and mm. we went into the relationship with no um we we weren't editing ourselves in any way we were being like very true to who we were we had really fun conversations about like what are your worst qualities and we would, third day, yeah. we would like pick each other's brains on things like that. So it got rid of the concept of um, a honeymoon period, you mm. know, because we never started from a place of like, put the mask on and be, our, be the best version of ourselves for a relationship to work. People do so often. People do, I think, 99% of the what time. What do you think happens with that when that does happen? And have you had that in previous relationships where a couple years later you're like, whoa. For sure. Well, and I've done that and I've noticed that even more so because I don't want to throw anybody else that I dated under the bus. Mm -hmm. But I did that myself. I mean, I think that's kind of a natural um, a natural thing that people want to do. They, they want to impress someone that they've met and seem like... Uh, they've really got their fucking life in order. And they've got it all together. So it's, you put on that mask of, I'm this great person and oh, I'll open doors for you and I do, you know, and here's this stuff and you do all these things to be impressive, but you can only maintain that for so long. If it's not who you are. And then yeah. that's when the honeymoon period kind of ends because then somebody starts seeing you in normal life situations where you can't necessarily put that mask on and they start going, ooh, I never, I also, never thought that was there. It also goes the other way too. I think one of the lessons that I learned with dating, because I did a lot more dating than you did, like you going did. out on dates and meeting people. And when we met, I was, we actually came from two very different places, but wanting in the end the same thing. I was so happy with being single. I was so happy with my alone time. I really got to that place where I loved my life. Mm. But I absolutely did want to find my person. But I let go of that need for it to be now. I, I, I finally found the place where it was like, okay, it will come when it comes. He will come when he comes. I really want a baby. So at 38, if I haven't met anyone, I'll do it on my own. Like mm. I had my plan of life is going to be blissful for me and I'm going to be good. 
But when that guy comes, I really want to be able to share it with him. I want him to fit. So when we met, it's that thing of we make people make the mistake of you sit in front of a person and you're so worried about whether they like you. Mm. That you also tend to look past the fact that maybe they chew with their mouth open mm. or they do these things that after a year, you're going to want to punch them in mm -hmm. the face. <laughs> Just so, because it's not only them putting on a mask, but it's you putting a mask on them. Whew. You're pretending that you're okay with this stuff. And so eventually your true colors you come settle. Out. And you've, yeah. you've settled for things about them. And now all of a sudden you're getting to know each other on a whole new level of things that you didn't think were there or were real or ignored. So you're not even the people that met in the first place. You're now finally truly who you are and seeing the person for truly mm. who they are. And you're kind of feeling a little gypped because you're like, that's not who I started dating. And then the communication is completely gone. You didn't give yourself the chance. Whereas when we started to, to date, there was no... I wasn't turning up to that date like, oh my God, I hope he likes me. It's like, I'm so good. I'm just going to meet this guy and get to know him. I'm going to be totally authentically myself, which wasn't hard to do because at the time I was in practice of that. Um, and it is a practice, right? It's mm. something you have to continue to work on to be bold enough and brave enough to truly be authentic. Uh, and we just listened to each other and shared. And there was not one point of any of our conversations and still not hesitation of what to say what they'll think of what you're saying, holding that back just in case they don't like it about you. It was just total transparency. And at the end of the day, after five dates, we liked each other enough to kiss for the first time and wow. realized that, well, there's even, there's not just physical attraction. There's not just connection. There is like, there's this also sexual like attraction and, um, there was that well, spark. Chemistry, chemistry yeah. that I'm trying to go for. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you can meet someone and be like, you're amazing. Then you kiss them and you're like, oh, wow. That so true. Really chemistry is so important. And so important. the yeah. chemistry was off the charts too. And that was when, you know, we really started to date after that. But I think what you were trying to say is we went into it with no labels, right? And I think that was something that you said to me Don't too. put words into my mouth. That is not what <laughs> <laughs> we, I It's mean, like no expectation, right? right? Like you weren't thinking, I need to be in a relationship. You're both like, we're good. We're figuring out life. Yeah. And it was also This, this person's compliment. a really cool friend. Like yeah. this is, but at I, the same, I love having lunch with her. And at that. the same time, I had to be very aware. And this was, you know, the work that I was doing. I've not tried to project on him what I wanted us to be, even though the chemistry and the this were off the charts. He was just coming out of something so very serious and so very big and there's babies involved and you're still going through divorce at the time. And it's like, I cannot rush this man into this, even if I'm thinking in my head, oh my God, I think he's the one forever. Mm -hmm. And I thought that very early on. And it would have been really easy for me to, to scare him with that, to ask for more from him, to ask for more commitment. To demand and it would have scared me for sure. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And so one of the things that I had to work through was just continue to show him who you are. Let him show you who he is. If it's right, it will get there in the time. What's a label going to give me right now? He shows me and understanding love languages, right? I am physical touch and words of affirmation, but he is acts of service in like first, second and third place. So mm. I had to really take notice of all the things he was doing for me and showing me the way that he felt all the time, constantly, before he could verbally say the words to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. There was such a learning curve there. And then he's also very good at that too. We had lots of conversation about love languages. But I think that's the thing, right? You have to be in a position when going into a relationship where you know what you want, but you're also okay with it taking time. You're also okay with it if this person doesn't end up being that person. You have to let go of the desperation of needing someone so you can allow it to just grow on its own. And if it doesn't work out, you take it as, okay, universe, thank you so much. I am open and ready for the next opportunity to find. Mm -hmm. um, but it's big. It's hard. You know, We have a lot of stuff, personal stuff we've got to work through to get there. There's so much truth, too, in everything that you've said. I mean, it's, it's, I don't even know where to start, but <laughs> what do you think that – um, made you because you were going through a divorce at the time and yeah. Sharna you were also in this place where you're like I'm, I want somebody but I'm also good what do you think it was that made you realize um, maybe Brian maybe it would be you to, like okay let's push this forward 
I love love. Like I love being in relationships and I love sharing my life with someone. Um, I'm not, I, I, I've never enjoyed being single. Um, so getting to the place before Sharna of spending time with my kids and being alone in the home and coming out of the, the marriage and the situation that I was in, I really found peace in, in that. So a new relationship I really wanted to make sure was just adding. It wasn't completing mm -hmm. something. Um, it was just somebody that's, that's on the same path, like-minded, just joining my path and walking it with me. For however long, it, you know, I never put any, uh, any limits on it of like, is this a long-term thing? Like, is this, I never went into any of it with any sort of goals or expectations. Um, it was just really, again, we had such amazing conversation and I was really open to this concept of like, I, um, I love having this and I want to have more of this. And I, I love being around her and, uh, then when my kids met her, they loved her. And it was like, this is, it was just a situation that met no resistance at any yeah. point. And that's one of the biggest things I think I could say. This was the easiest thing I've ever done mm. was being with Brian. And it could have been complicated. It could have been so complicated. It could have been so complicated. Super public, coming out of a divorce, kids involved. There's so many lanes there where it could have been met a lot of resistance. Zero across the board. Zero resistance. And that was really cool. And in the beginning, I, I, I knew, and I don't know how to say this, I've never ever experienced this before in any relationship. It was like, some of these are going to sound crazy. I would hear things in my head when I look, when I look at him. I'll never forget the day mm. we were in my house at mm -hmm. Belden. We were, I don't even think the dining table had been moved out yet. Right. So okay. before we did all the renovation yeah. things and he came in and we said hello and he was standing there talking and suddenly I heard the word husband in my head. Nice. Yeah. And I was like, it like shook me for a second. I've never heard that. I've not, not been someone that's like, I can't wait to get married. You know what I mean? Not, <laughs> no pressure. But like, <laughs> I, <Right. laughs> but I don't think it necessarily <laughs> meant husband. It just meant like life partner. You know what I mean? And then things where I'd be thinking about him in my head and not necessarily asking for signs, but asking questions. And then driving along Beverly, for example, and you hit every single green light all the way mm. down from Fairfax to Gower. Like it, it just, things that never happen that are, you can't go, that's not a sign. And I know that sounds silly to some people, right? Like that's just coincidence, but no. Not when you're talking to me. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> that's never happened to me. Yeah. yeah. And so often it would be the universe showing me things, whether it's overhearing conversation, a song that comes on the radio that says the actual like words or the answer or the title. And so I took notice of these signs and was like, okay, I'm on the right track. And I think those things gave also me confidence and peace in allowing him to take time. I got there way earlier than he did. <laughs> Yeah, but, so but we you had done it before, right? So yes, many times, like you were saying, yes. you've dated a lot more, but he's been in a lot more long yeah. relationships. Right. Yeah, married. Yeah. Yeah. We had a thing early on where I couldn't. It was really hard for me to say I love you, mm. not because I didn't, but because that to me was like, that's just a big step in that's graduating to a new yeah. level. So we used to have an ongoing joke where I'd just say I like you a lot. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like we will go back and forth on that. that. But yeah. how would that make then you, Sharna, feel? Because I and I know that you're she in was a, great with it. Yeah, because you 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 were in a point at that point in your life, I think, where you were more felt complete. But you know, like years before, would you have been like, why is he not saying I love you? One hundred percent. Yeah, I love spending time with you. At, at another point in my life, would have felt like someone telling me that they just can't love me. Mm -hmm. Right. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I understood that it was him doing the absolute most that he could at the time <laughs> to show me and share with me, but also knowing he needs time to get there for the rest of it. And that, in the end of the day, then him saying those words, those three words, actually means so much more because mm. he really took his time to truly know deeply that he's there and that he feels this. There's no just, 
people throw around the word I love you all the time. They come out way too quick. They come out way too often. And there was no question in my mind when he said it that he deeply meant it. And he'd also been showing me that was how he felt for months beforehand. Right, the service. Um, and I'll never forget when he said it to me. <laughs> We're laying in bed. <laughs> And he said, I love you. And I looked at him, I was like, say it again. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Say it again. And yeah. he said it. And it was the best. Wow. Aww. I think... I um, love reliving this yeah. <laughs> I think I think people um, take those words too lightly. They yeah. don't... They, they don't walk the walk. They just sort of talk the talk. And mm. like... Oh, if I say I love you, that that's some grand gesture. So. Or it's appeasing this. Yeah, or, yeah. So it's but it, so it's just the words. So they're accomplishing something. And it's like no, there's to really walk the walk of those words and truly love somebody. You know, being in love with somebody out of like people go through different stages of it, but right. you still love people. Um, when you love them, you want the best for them, and you know, and I I say that to people all the time, even people that I don't necessarily get along with too much anymore it doesn't mean that i don't love them mm -hmm. on some level and don't you know wish the absolute best for them maybe not the absolute best for you in my life like us you know us hanging out and me helping you make it better yeah. but i absolutely wish the best for you and your family and and everyone that's around you and hope to god that you that you accomplish the things in your life that you want uh, to piggyback off that a little bit i got a flash of a relationship that i'm in now with a friend who um so brian like for example your way of showing love can also be to not reach out to them because like for me for example i'm thinking about this one friend who i i'm like ah, I, I love you and i want to reach out because i know how you're doing right now and you probably need some help but I know also that that I don't want this energy in my life right now, but I also would be being a crutch for you. And I need you to go get the help you need, the right, like therapy. I don't say this to this person, but as much yeah. as I want to text and reach out, I'm like, God. don't I interfere. have that feeling with people all the time. Yeah. Of like I, I've really in life worked on um, people People are supposed to have the experience of life that they're supposed to have for whatever reason. Yes. And um, if we're on the same path and we do that together and I can help you through it, great. But if you are having an experience that doesn't line up with my life at all right now, I wish you the absolute best in that experience. But that's an experience that you're supposed to have. Mm. And for me to help you through that necessarily is not doing you a service it's doing you an injustice because i'm keeping you from having that experience that could possibly be some catalyst for you in life of finding something new and and you know and and finding a, a new incredible place to be and come from um so i try and be really aware of that mm -hmm. which is what mm -hmm. it sounds like you're doing also it's like you, yeah there's certain times where you go God, I know I could, I could do so much in this person's life and really help them through this, but I'm not helping them. I'm doing it more for myself. So now you've been dating for a while. You've said that I love you, I guess, at this point. And then <laughs> yeah, you do yeah, dancing? Baby, so you're not yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we had, we had joked early on in the relationship because um, they've been approaching me for Dancing with the Stars for years. Uh, it was like 13 oh, okay. seasons at this point. And it was always just a hard pass. Why was it always a hard pass? Because I'm not, a, I, I have no aspirations of being, of doing musical theater or dancing. Or like I, I, I've been acting since I was nine professionally. And so I'm, I'm good with that. Like I didn't want to uh, do this show with people that I didn't know just to, you know, to compete as a dancer. It just didn't interest me at all. But at the point when we were dating and then uh, the question came up, and, and the offer was there. Um, it just made sense. I mean, it was it was during COVID. It took COVID. us a while to decide yes, though. It did take us a while because there are a lot of moving parts with it, and there were a lot of things we were really specific about. Because I, we we didn't want to do the show at the risk of it negatively affecting our relationship mm -hmm. at all. 
So it was really about making sure that story-wise they weren't going to go any places that we didn't want to go. They weren't going to talk about things that we didn't want to talk about. It was We were really specific on um, sharing ourselves authentically and not having somebody try and produce what we were feeling or saying and micromanage it and make it something else. But it just seemed like an amazing opportunity to get to know her and what I mean, she's been dancing her whole life and unless you dance it's not something that you can really fully understand uh, unless you're doing it so doing the show um, and really getting to experience what what it's like for her and the, the you know the judging that goes with it and the pressure of learning routines and 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 the the physical uh, challenges that come with it just with your body and the, and the the hours that you have to put in to really do it well, I had I came out of that experience with such a different appreciation of who she is and what she does. Um, I remember before that we had gone to Universal and Disney Florida. She did a, a dance competition. She hosted it, and she had to and she did a dance thing in the middle. It was like a like a 15, 30 second routine just for, it was a bunch of kids that, you know, that were all aspiring professional dancers and they were so excited that Sharna was there because Sharna is one of the best in the world at what it is she does. So for them, it's just, this, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's kids seeing their, their hero, mm -hmm. right? somebody that they idolize in front of them. And I remember she danced and then, um, and I, I had this thought of like, oh, it was amazing, but I expect you to be amazing. This, this is what you do. But then after doing the show, I realized like, oh, that how much work goes into just those 15, 30 seconds of dancing, the lifetime of work that she's put into being as good as she is. To make it doing. look like it's effortless. Yeah. yeah. So I had a different appreciation for it after that. Like now when she dances, there's just a part of me that's, in such awe of it compared to before where I sort of, I didn't necessarily take it for granted, but I didn't, I wasn't able to look at it and appreciate it th the same way because I didn't know, I didn't understand the work that it took mm. to get there. I just, I just saw the finished product and was like, oh, it's the finished product is amazing, but you already know that. So what, you know, you don't need to hear it from me. <laughs> like I didn't. It'd be like seeing you cry in a movie or something, and we'd be like, "Okay, he's acting, whatever." Right. He's but been, you don't realize what goes into. He's been crying like, in what things for pulling? years. What are you pulling? What are you drawing yeah, from? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like somebody working on your car, you know, doing a remodel of something, and you just don't, be, you don't appreciate the work that goes into yeah. it because you haven't really watched and seen what has gone into it. You just see the finished product, and you go, oh, it's beautiful." So like that actually brought a memory all of a sudden to me of I remember having a talk with you Sharna once I, th I don't remember if this part was on camera might have been off camera and you said to me like you're like Frank I always thought I was just going to be like a ballroom teacher maybe I would uh, you know go on a little tour here and there and then Dancing with the Stars came along and all of a sudden like all of life changed like tell me about that what did you think you would be doing and then how did that <laughs> I mean, honestly, change? When I left Australia at 18 and I went to London and it was to be a world champion ballroom dancer. That was what I wanted. I had absolutely no idea my life was going to go in a different direction. Um, it, it was it was always the goal. I was going to be a world champion, own a dance studio back in Australia, give back to the dance community. That was going to be me. I had no, I had no dreams of being on television, no dreams of being famous beyond being a champion ballroom dancer within my um, community of, of dancing. Um, and when I did my first tour with a show called Burn the Floor, I remember when going into the tour like, oh, I can't believe I'm going like, to sell out and make money from this dancing thing. I'm, a, I'm an artist. But I will never forget the first show that I did. We were in uh, Korea. Korea, I think. And... 
this audience. I'll never forget the first show. I'm not, I don't remember where it was. Was it Korea? No, was it? we rehearsed in Singapore. We rehearsed in Singapore. I'll, I'll never forget because the humidity yeah. was at 90%. But our first show... I know this. You'll never forget it. Our first show was in Korea. And so people were like mosh pitting at the front of the stage. I had to do this section where I went out into the audience and they were grabbing at my costume to get a beat. And I was like, I felt like Britney Spears at the time. I was like, this is wild. But beyond that, I saw how dancing could affect people emotionally, entertain them, make them laugh and cry and the intensity of it. And I fell in love with being able to affect people like that. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to be on stage. So then theater was the thing. I was like, I found my home. And I truly found myself on stage too, as a woman, as a dancer, so many things. It was um, growth and therapy and there's so many things for me. And then Dancing with the Stars saw us. We were on Broadway in 2009 and Dancing with the Stars came to see the show and they saw Max, Peter, myself uh, and a couple of others that they were really interested in having be a part of Dancing with the Stars. And at the time, I now knew what Dancing with the Stars was and now I was in love with performance and all the things and knew that Dancing with the Stars was about the biggest gig you could get. At that point, how many seasons had been of the show? Had it already been on I, for a while? I joined, yeah, I joined on season season 13. Is that right? So it wasn't okay. 13 years ago because they were doing two seasons yeah. a year. It was like six years. Season three yeah. or four. Um, so maybe it was like five, six years. Um but I remember having the interview with them and I felt like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. So life kind of just naturally went in this direction. But it wasn't until I was here and on television and being told to start up social media accounts and having people recognize me at airports thinking, wow, how much my life has changed. I never imagined this would be where I was going to land. How do you feel about that, Daisy? Yeah? She's such a strange she likes. I hope you're getting all this. Lovely staring yeah. at Brian. Um, and I, it was very surreal for me that people would recognize me in places and, and uh, say things to me. We, we, we go on tour and people say how much my dancing or choreography has helped them through hard times. The effect on people that I never, ever mm. knew I could have. And so it led me into a life that I could never have dreamed for myself, but I'm so grateful for everything. Don't fall day. off the chair. Oh, you want daddy now? Okay, yeah, fine. For the people who are not watching this, but they're only hearing, we're talking about the dog, not a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. the dog. Don't fall off the chair. Yeah. Don't fall off the chair. Yeah. rolling around on the floor. Thank so, you for yeah, clarifying yeah. that. That, would have, that definitely would have come back. And then, Brian, so kind of to piggyback a little bit off that, so Sharna, that experience of you know going to the airport, getting recognized, you had already experienced, Brian, from, for years, she has right? She an airport story that would, like... I mean, I have maybe five to ten people. Whoa. Me. He turned up to 50,000 people. How many? What was this? 15,000. 15, At an airport? Airport in Spain. Ian and I were flying to Madrid to do a promotional, like, week and a half in Spain. Um, the station that the show was on thought it would be a good idea to announce that we were coming the day we were coming like the flight we were going to be on, the whole thing, hoping that, you know, some people would show up at the airport and it would make a great news story. Wow. 15,000 people showed up at the airport. The, air, the whole airport was shut down because nobody could get to gates to get on flights. They had uh, lookalikes of us. So we, so we, had, flown, we had flown for, it's like a 14-hour flight. Um, of course, we took sleeping pills because... You know, you don't want to stay awake for 14 hours. Uh, plane lands, and the, the stewardess, uh, the flight attendant comes up and says, there are some people in the airport, so they just need you to wait on the plane for a minute. So we're thinking, like, we're in the, you know, the airplane bathroom doing our hair and stuff, going, oh, man, there's, you know, maybe there's some press or some people in the oh. airport. Uh, from the second we got off the plane, it was very... Um, odd and different like it was very there was a lot of panic it everybody was speaking spanish so we were like i don't know what's going on but it like like very so it doesn't feel great. very high stress very high energy like police everywhere like encircling us go and they were we were going from one thing to you know this back room to another back room down a back hallway to another room and we end up in a room that's the whole thing is wood paneling inside 
we're surrounded by, uh, by police, local police, and it's a long room. And I remember looking at the end of the room and seeing the back of somebody's head going and thinking, that looks a lot like us. And all of a sudden that door opens and people, and they rush out that door. And then our door opens and we're totally surrounded. So they, so the pack just moved. So it was like, oh, okay, I guess we're going. Um, and we get out and there's 15,000 people in the airport. It was so tightly packed that you could lift your feet and just move with the crowd because you were just like sandwiched in like sergeant. And they don't know it's you at this point because you no, have the lookalikes? Oh. So they sent the lookalikes out the other door just to get the crowd to move mm. enough so we could get out and get to our car. Um, wow. Wow. I mean, I had gone from seeing, you know, watching like uh, footage of football games uh, and crazy things happening in the crowd and people getting crushed to death and, you know, pinned in like uh, chain link fences and all so So... I'm starting to panic because it's literally so tightly packed. You're just sort of moving with the crowd and you're like, I guess this is where like, you're not, you're not actually walking. There's no re there's, there's no local motion within your feet. You're not moving yourself anywhere. You're Whoa. just like kind of keeping your balance with your feet. Um, and then all of a sudden we get out the doors and the crowd sort of parts enough and you see this little car parked. And we get in and then we're on the freeway and there's people running on the freeway trying to get to the, and it was, that was that was insane. So yeah, so I, crazy. That is a wild. I mean, that level also of like popularity with the show. What's your relationship with that character with that show? When like I've I've had personal friends, but also interviews. I have one friend who was on a really iconic show, a really close friend of mine, and has done movies since then. Has done shows, and people will still call her that character from that show, or they oh, will all the time. right. And so. And her relationship, I, I, you know, again, like not to throw anybody else under the bus who's not in this interview to talk about themselves, mm -hmm. is very interesting with that with that whole dynamic. What's yours like with that? Um, well, at first, my, I think the natural inclination is you want to separate yourself from that as much as possible. So I was like, the show had finished, and I was like, maybe if I change my name and I go by a different thing, and I, you know bleach my hair or I do like you want to do Whoa. anything you possibly can to sort of separate from that um but then for me at least I got to the point where I embraced it and I thought okay this is it's not going to go anywhere it's not going to go away luckily because that was an amazing experience and I gained and it opened a lot of doors and I, I gained so much just in my life from that it's now up to me to play other characters and do other things that are memorable also. So people start remembering me as that as David Silver, but then also the guy from Desperate Housewives. Also the guy, oh, he was in that Terminator show, it was really good. Oh, he was in that show Wedding Band. Oh, he was in the movie Domino. Oh, like you start becoming more than just the one thing that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's not, it's definitely not an easy thing. I, I, uh, I completely understand and feel for whoever it is that you're talking about because it's a very unique situation. It's a, it's a very unique um, obstacle to have. It's almost like they'll interview you, for example, let's say about uh, Desperate Housewives, right? But then they'll throw in a 90210 right. question. Hey, so, right? you know, yeah. we can't do this interview without right. asking about 90210. And you're like, what could you possibly ask about that that I haven't answered 50,000 times? Yes. You know? And, like, it's so important to really know if you're still friends with the cast or who are you talking to and not right. talking to. It becomes such a thing, right? Yeah. People are curious, though. I mean, I get it. I, I understand that more now than I did before I didn't under I didn't embrace the fascination with it, but in trying to do that and really understand it, um, you know, for me it was a very mundane situation because it was I would go to work every day, and so for us we were just making a show, but for other people they were just watching it every week, and it became such a big part of their lives for the nineties. I mean, we were in from nineteen ninety mm. to two thousand, so I understand. That feeling of, you know, well, we, we watched you guys for 10 years all being best friends. But, you know, do you guys still talk now? Like, what is... So it's as much as the show has ended 
um, the characters haven't ended for them. Yeah. Just that period of the show, being able to watch it from 1990 to 2000. But those characters are still alive. So everybody, on some level, because they so equate us with those characters, think like, okay, so you and Steve still talk, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, did Steve ever get his license and get a new car? Like, it's they, they, <laughs> they, they, they continue on with the story yeah. uh, to, to so fill in the gap of what isn't there. Right. So interesting. There's this one guy I'll, I'll never forget, uh, Michael Kreisel. Yeah. Um, do you know who this is? Yeah. You really know Michael Kreisel? I don't know him personally, oh. but I know who he is, yeah. Loves 90210. I haven't talked to him in a, in a couple years, but we were really close. He was the boss at ABC. I think... I t he's the one who I talked to on the phone when I did the GMA interview. Oh, for sure. Yes. Remember they had we me would have done and that. I yes. FaceTimed. Yes. And I was like, hey, how's it going? You have a great memory. I'm going to show him this, actually. I don't have a great memory. I just, those random things sometimes that come up and you're, you're like, I'll never, I'll actually never forget this thing. Yeah, we, I worked with him. <laughs> he was in, uh, he's in New York now. He's still like the big boss. At that point, he was in LA, sat ac across from me in the newsroom. I sat like to the side. Yeah. He would sit right there. From 4 a.m. when he would get in till about 3 or 4 p.m. when he left, 90210. Yeah. Morning till night. That's he did what not they said when I his, when I had to FaceTime with day. him. They were like, "No, you don't understand. He's our boss now." But yes. like, <laughs> it would be so great if you FaceTimed him. Twelve hours a day for five days a week. That's what we would. It would be in the newsroom. Wow. We'd have like three hundred monitors up here, and, and then, then a little his right there. Nine hundred two hundred never ended. <laughs> never ended. So actually, I did an interview with Tiffany. Yeah. And when she came in, I had her sign a little like nine hundred two and I gave it to him. Like it was so like right. the thing you would have to do to like you know you so can't funny. not have right. someone from nine hundred two. Do you want a promotion? Exactly. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But and also, we all love him. He he's incredible. He, he still is. Like I'm sure. Yeah. Super really nice incredible. Guy. Yeah. I mean, for us to want to all do that for him, you know. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, having both experienced your versions of that, what would you say to somebody who thinks, when I have this amount of money, I'll be happy? When I have, if I had that kind of fame, I would be happy? Uh, I think anyone that is chasing it, if I have that, no matter what it is. Whatever it is. Whatever it is, whether it's fame or money, you're already in the wrong lane. You have to be happy where you are to get more happy. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It's like it's like tuning into the wrong radio station. You want to listen to the greatest hits of the 90s, but you're listening to heavy metal. You mm. can't be mad that you're not listening to the 90s unless you change the station yourself. So if you want more of what is over there, then you have to get over there first. Be happy with where you are and what you have and know that more can then come to you. But the more you want the next thing and the next thing or the unattainable thing, yeah. that is the way you are going to live the rest of your life. Because mm -hmm. when you get that thing, it will still never be enough for you. Because yeah, Jim Carrey, I think, said, I wish everybody would have the fame, the power, the money, so that they realize, in the end, it's not what's going to make you happy. Absolutely. I agree with that. You guys talked earlier about like when you met and what you were both going through in life. What has it been like to then have your child, which is probably worth more than a million mirror balls <laughs> for you? Well, you know, what, what was that like? And, and to figure out, okay, co-parenting and navigating the perfect dynamic. Well, there's so many questions in that. I yeah, think. yeah. First of all, in the two and a half years, coming up to three, two, no. That's crazy. In the time that we've been wow. together, it feels somebody like the other day was together. talking about what season of Dancing with the Stars, were, and they were like, "Oh, it was like you know, 2021." I was like, "No, it's not." And then I thought about it. And I was like, "God, it was the fucking 2021 season." Right. Wow. We met in 2020. Crazy. Like it's now 20. It's been that long. It's now 2023. Yeah. And we had already been dating before that season yeah. happened. Like that's that's but, crazy yeah. how also, time flies. What where I was headed with that is in what is kind of a short amount of time, my life has completely changed. I went from Her life. single woman mm. living in the hills yeah. with my two dogs, do what I want when I want with my amazing morning routine and my meditation, my gratitude practice and all these like make time for yourself, do the things. But knowing what I wanted, the big family and all What was the that. board called? What are vision board. So um, she did a vision board that was, a, and she had done it before we met and started uh, hanging out and spending time. And it was literally, there was stuff on this board that was like, okay, you absolutely like copy and pasted wow. what life with me would be like because it was 
it was a silhouetted picture, but I'll never forget it. It was a woman walking, holding a man's hand with three young kids around on either side. And I was like, that's, we started dating. That's exactly what it was. How many kids did you have before? I had, I have four four before, but three young kids. Mm -hmm. Cassius, my oldest is, he's turning 21 this year. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so stepping into that world, even though I had such a dramatic change, I'd been ready for it for so long. I have a lot of people DM me and ask me, what's it like stepping into having um, stepkids now or going into co-parenting? What is that like? What is that like? So the stepkids question is, it's so beautiful. First of all, they make it easy. They're incredible kids. And Brian and Megan did such an amazing job. Cash is also an amazing kid. There's been no resistance. I had a beautiful relationship with them. But yeah, my life dramatically changed from doing what I want to getting up early in the morning and helping get ready for school Mm. or, you know, picking them up from school or or activities or being with them on weekends. What can we do with the kids on the weekends? But I was so ready for that. I wanted that. There's nothing in life that I feel like I missed out on. And I was so grateful to have the experience with them before having Zane. I got to test out motherhood with these guys. I got to learn things and grow with them about parenting and understanding kids learning how to trust your instincts and doing it Mm. and knowing oh my gosh i think i can be really good at that so i had a beautiful experience before having say admittedly an an infant and newborn is a completely different ball game but i did learn to trust my instincts and i feel like it was such a gift to have them in my life for that period of time before zane because it it really let me know first of all i have an amazing partner that is an incredible dad uh and we can do this together we're a great team when it Mm. comes to parenting so knowing that zane is going to be so taken care of with that as well but witnessing him learning so much from him watching the way he communicated with the kids the way he handles situations it only helped me grow it kind of fast-tracked my growth into being a parent and i feel like it all um was meant to be in that sense and, and got me ready for being a mom for zane and i'm not i am a first time mom but He's not first time. We're not a first time relationship for that in that sense. So I've had so much comfort and support in mm. in having this newborn. So when I have the intrusive thoughts or I have the new mum moments of like, what am I doing? I know I have someone there. I have my rock there. I have someone that I trust and know what he's already done has been so beautiful and I've witnessed it so I can let go a little bit. Um, what were some of those intrusive thoughts? Oh my God, dude. Um, some of them are really even hard to say out loud. They, they come in like chaotic images of things. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The best one I can, just, I can explain, and it happens many times in many different ways when you're in the car and I'll have Zane in the car with me and I'll just be driving along and suddenly I see an accident that's not really happening, happening next to me where a car is rolling over and it lands on me and our car flips and Zane's in the back seat and I'm mm-hmm. crawling out of my car and the jaws of life are crawling him out. And all these visions happen in a moment. Yes. You see them all. It's crazy what your imagination can can do. do. Yeah. And it, for a moment, paralyzes you as I'm driving. And it is so terrible. I had for a while there the chandelier over the stairs. Suddenly, I was Mm. walking underneath it and I saw it falling on us while I was holding Zane. They're these really weird, crazy things. And dark, intrusive thoughts, sometimes they come at your own hand, too. You have this fear that you've not been paying attention and given them something to eat that they're now choking on. You know, it's, and it's not because you're being negligent or trying to do things. I think it's this weird way of your brain giving you all the possibilities of what could go wrong so you can, you can make sure they don't. So you're ready. So you're ready, but then you're on edge. You're ready for too many things that some aren't even likely to happen. And I had to really take time and use tools to get through that of knowing the gr- I can go, thank you, and let it move on. Thank you for the awareness. Yes, let yes. It move on. I think thank it's the part the of the human brain powerful. that loves control. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to figure out subconsciously how to control every situation as much as possible. Yeah. Especially when you're a parent. And then it's learning, it's learning that you can't. Yeah. You can't control. You can't really control any of it. Um, so you just have to be as aware as possible. Did you, so since you had had kids before, is that a common thing with a first child or is it? It is. Okay, it is. A, a first child especially, it's really common because you've never um, felt that kind of responsibility in your life before. And it's a selfless responsibility. 
You, in wanting control, you want control of your own life for you, for your own safety. And then all of a sudden you have a child and it's like, it's not about me anymore. Like if, the, if a chandelier falls, I might get hit in the head, but I'll be okay. But what about for him? So it's a different, it's viewing things from mm. a different perspective and it's the unknown. And so that can be, that can be scary. And then as you continue to have kids and your family grows and you start realizing like, oh, I, you know, I, I'm going to have these silly thoughts all the time. I just need to stay. I just need to continue doing what it is I've done so far and trust that it's, I'm, uh, I'm present and aware enough that uh, my child will be okay. But I wonder if some people are more prone than others because, and I, I don't want to be the crazy <laughs> cat person <laughs> to compare, ever even dream that comparing my cat would be right. like comparing a child. But I child. had a cat one time. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even dream right. of it. However, I have a really crazy cat story to tell you. <laughs> with that said. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget this story. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll never forget this story. I, uh, no, but uh, really with my, I have two cats now and I will, I travel so much and I have, you know, a housemate and I also have friends who will come over or a cat sitter to come take care of them, whatever it is. So they're never alone, but I will have these thoughts where I'll be like, did they leave that thing that I would never leave out that is going to make the cat whatever? Right. Like I even have this one exercise machine that has like a sharp edge on it. And you know, pets love to like rub right. their face. Cats, yeah. Cats, they're always yeah. So I'm like, I literally will jump out of bed at like 4 a.m. and be like, I'm going to go put it away because what if they... So I know I'm prone to have that. Mm -hmm. Do you think you were prone before having Zane or did it all of a sudden come out of nowhere? That's a really good question. I don't think I've been a, a negative thoughts person. Like, no, I don't think I was prone to it before childhood. Mm. The ch childhood. childhood. <laughs> before, yeah, yeah. before I was born. Yeah, yeah. Before I was born, I was not prone to anything. Um, I don't really recall being someone that is worried about all the worst things that could happen. Mm. Honestly, you, I think no. my mum is a little bit that. Mm. Yeah. But maybe that was, again, after childbirth. Um, but once Zane came into the world, you are, especially as a woman, right? You've given birth. Your hormones are still balancing. You are trying to process this unbelievable amount of love that you feel. All these feelings that you have, you have cracked. Well, and you got to think too, for nine months, like you're taking care of something that is inside of you. Mm. So it's all about eating the right things, doing that. And now all of a sudden it's on the outside and it's like, oh my God, now now the entire world can get to this baby that has been safe right, yes. inside of me. How do I hours. protect it now? And you become so worried about all the things you can't control. And you are not prepared. No one prepares you for, and they cannot, the equal amount of fear that now lives within you alongside that love because it happened. Mm. It now, you have all this love but you have an equal amount of fear and you learn to try and balance it. The tools you can use to work through it. I'm sure people by the fourth kid are like, Hey, it's fine. Right. right. Yeah. I'll just rub dirt on it. Yeah. It'll be okay. Yeah. I remember when, when Noah was born was with Megan, tight. it was like the passy would drop, you'd steam it, you'd boil water, you'd do all the yeah. stuff. And by the end of it, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like put it back in Journey's mouth. He'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. He's you know. good. And he's just, totally fine. Just, you know? just wipe it off. It'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. first time parenting is so big. It's the unknown. There's so much. No books you read. Nothing can prepare you for it in the way that just simply experience does. I think and that's one of the things, though, with the other kids, with Noah Bodie and Journey, that has helped her so much is that she has experienced the fact that kids... You know, she's so known, resilient. she's seen Journey especially grow up so much over the past two and a half years. Like we see pictures of him that are in her mm -hmm. phone. It's just mind boggling baby the baby. changes that he went through. Mm -hmm. So as much as Zane is her first baby, he's not completely because she's experienced right. a little bit of it. So she yeah. understands like bumps and bruises and living life and stuff happening happens whether you want it to or not. It's all about how you deal with those things yeah. in the moment. That's what you have the control over. It's like, am I gonna panic every time? Or am I just gonna like calmly, thoughtfully like assess the situation and figure out how I can best serve that mm. moment? Yeah. Do you want, can we do a quick little clearing and see what comes up? Sure. Let's do it. Yeah, all right, yeah. about these intrusive thoughts. Yeah. What, um, 
For, for most of these, I won't need to get an age, but I might, and I'll let you know if I do, All and right. then I'll have to ask your age. But uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm you're just, good with I'm it? just old. Yeah, yeah I, okay. I am. <laughs> old. Yeah, yeah. I know from some Old-ish. Years. So I, I'm going to take my phone out because I do use this little chart that helps me. These are magnets. Um, so I got these from a healer in Mexico who first helped me how to use magnet or taught me how to use magnets to help uh, clear things from people. So you're going to see me kind of, have you ever heard of muscle testing at all? Uh, uh, kinesiology, exactly. we do that all the time. Yeah, yeah like David Hawkins. Yeah, so yeah. doctors will do it. They'll put like a sugar packet uh, or like different, uh, like a vitamin C or whatever and see how your body reacts to yeah. it, right? So our, yeah, our doctor yeah. puts these little vials of different chemicals yes, and can yes, literally yes, test yes, your yes. muscles and see what you're... Perfect. You have a great doctor. I love that. Yeah, yeah, like functional medicine doctors do this. So I'll do that. I'm doing it with my fingers. You'll kind of see. I'm awesome. going to narrow down certain things that are coming up for you once I establish a connection. I'll do one at a time. Once we find something, I'll give you the age that it started. Because here's the thing, we think, for example, some of this might come up from since childbirth, right? Like Zane. But there could have been something you saw, like I was telling you before we started rolling, um, I saw a fight when I was in middle school, and all of a sudden it pops into my head randomly 10, what, 50, 20 years later? Right. So there might be something that you saw at childbirth that is being reawakened, or you mentioned your mom. We have inherited emotions too. So at conception, we take on a lot of things that junk DNA is not junk DNA. There's a lot of things in there that we inherited from ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so there might be like, let's say your mom felt terror when she was, when she had you, that terror is now can be inherited. And you're carrying that when I clear it from you, I'm clearing the terror from her as well. It's just gone. Mm -hmm. The terror is not there anymore. So let's see what comes up. Awesome. Um, I'm thinking unless you probably don't have the intrusive thoughts with Zane since you've gone through it. Well, so maybe that's a different category. Yeah, 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 not so much. Yeah, yeah. So intrusive thoughts we can do with Sharna, and then right. we'll see what else okay. comes up. Um, okay, so Sharna, <laughs> do I have permission to connect with you? Yes. Okay. All right, am I testing for Sharna? Yeah, so you can see it goes strong. Am I testing for Frank? It goes weak. So everything I do now on myself, I'm doing for you. So this is why I work with people remotely, because when I'm clearing it, I'm not going to rub this magnet on your forehead. I'm gonna, you're going to see me rubbing it on my own. I'm clearing it for you. Everything I do now is Got it. happening to you. Got it. All right, energetically. So is there anything that we can clear that will help with intrusive thoughts regarding Zane's protection? Yeah, energetic, okay. So the first thing is energetic. Is it post-traumatic, offensive, mental? The first thing is mental, a will to, no will to, a broadcast, a programming. There's a mental programming that's, that's trapped. Usually this happens from something you saw, witnessed. It is a belief that became true for you. The first thing is it's out of my control. There's this programming in the mind that is it's out of my control. So can we get an age for when this began? Was this before the age of 30, after 30? How old are you now? 37. 35, 36, okay, 37. So this one's at 37. So even if you had Zane at 36, it's like give or take six months. This one is from 37 that wants to be cleared. So there's this belief, it's out of my control. Does that resonate? I was 37 when Zane was born. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just turned 37. Yeah. You were 37, okay. Is there more here? Yeah. Good, energetic. You would just turn to mental. There's another mental block. And this is a broadcast. So what this is, is sort of like you're a radio tower and you're, we're all, we all are, and we're broadcasting these little frequencies. So sometimes people will come to me and they'll be like, you know, I, I can't get, this actually did happen two weeks ago. Somebody was like, I've been asking for a raise for, I think it was like two years at this point. And they always say no, they always say no. We did this clearing. Barely anything came up in the session other than broadcast messages, which is what he was putting out. And it, the broadcasts were things like, I'm invisible, um, I'm not worthy, uh, you know, I can't remember what they were. There's not enough. That was another one. He messaged me two weeks later saying they called him into HR and offered him a $30,000 raise. He, had, he didn't ask for it. He didn't go back in. So like things like that were putting out these broadcasts, right? So you have a broadcast that is, um, okay, so it's right here. I'm worthy, I am weak, I am weird, I am wrong. I can't. And the broadcast is, I can't. So at some point, this, this was coming out of, I can't. What, and I can't is one of my more generic ones, but it can be, uh, once I get you the age, we'll know specifically what it is. I can't do this, I can't parent, I can't ask for help. Whatever it is, there's the, I can't. Um, this is from before the age of 30, after 30, after 35, 35. So is that 36? Was it while you were pregnant? Yes, can we clear it? So something that happened while you're pregnant where the thought came in that I can't. Now these... Did you say dad? 
Yeah. That's your dad. Okay, that's Hestro. Dad still. Hestro. Yeah. Um, and the one before it, the, I, what was it? It's I, out of my control. I can't, I, out of my control would be like mom. Her he, her happiness, her like peace, her. It's not testing strong for mom, but the dad one was for, I can't. Okay. It's out of my control might be you protecting, like it's out of my control. Like we were talking about, you can't control the things that are yeah, happening around you. I think it was you. out of your control as far as just relationship stuff also. Also his, his health, his rapid decline. All yeah. of that. Yeah. This is with dad? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's I can't. I can't. Yeah, what was happening with dad? Oh. Uh, A lot okay. of things happening with dad. Mm. But he came to visit. Uh, to, we wanted to tell him that I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, we told him in December. Uh, and by, He falsely claimed that he... Was well enough was, to travel. That he was given the okay by his doctors. Mm. Because he's a diabetic. He was dealing with all heart sorts patient, of uh, heart health patient, issues. Heart patient, kidney transplant. Didn't, never looked after his health. He was really unwell. And this was during COVID. Like, no, no right. doctor in their right mind would be like, oh, yeah, you should totally travel to the U.S. He came yeah. over at the end of 2021, and he passed away here mm. on that trip. Mm. Um, and it was really, it was a really hard trip because it made my relationship very obvious with him the lack of relation not lack of relationship i always tried but it was a very difficult relationship with him he was a very difficult person uh and i tried many times over the years to get him to look after his health more and more the scones i remember that he was defiant um mm. about trying to eat better and look after himself and he would lie all the time saying that he was in the same way he lied about his health being good enough to travel over and there's so, he was a compulsive liar. Compulsive and, what's the other one? Pathological. Yeah. He believed his lies deeply. And this has been my whole life. And I tried and tried and I really thought pregnancy could bring us closer. The idea of him being a grandfather, maybe we could just move on from all of that stuff. It could give him hope of trying to do better and be around for longer. Um, but within the time of his stay here, our, our visit got more and more negative. Um, and eventually he, he got sick while he was here and he ended up in hospital, ICU. And by the end of, it was actually January 28th, he passed away wow. in the hospital. Um, and I remember thinking, I can't deal with, I don't know how to deal. I can't fix it. I can't get him to eat better. I can't make his health better. Then when he was in hospital, he didn't, <laughs> the man didn't get travel insurance. It was like, who is going to cover your million dollar hospital bill wow. at this point? I can't. I have a baby coming. Like I, my my funds, our fund, my everything has to go towards our family. Yeah. I did, for a man that I barely had a relationship with, and it was just so so much. Yeah, it was so a bit of a mad situation. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, and to, been... to be around somebody that um, doesn't want to help themselves, and you so you so wish that they would because it's so important. It's just, it can become so frustrating, that thing of like, God, I, I, Circles back to what we said about the, remember, eat, like, was the help What are you eating that for? You, you know you shouldn't be eating it that, and it was just like, you know, like, would you eat it right in front of you? Yeah, oh, to that point. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. And oh, so you like just, you said, defiant. And you would just have to sit back and go, wow, I can't he control would, this man. He would, he was a diabetic, but he abused insulin in the sense that he would just eat whatever he wanted and use insulin injections to manage it which right. eventually kills your kidneys and every he other was thing so he up and down as far as his numbers he would uh, go from like, roller coaster oh, ride, yeah. and he had more bypasses that you could think at the age of 40 he had all of them in his 40s like i think it was triple or the six or whatever it wow. is and then by you know a, a few years ago he ended up having to have stint put in he was he had a, def a defibrillator and a pacemaker. Wow. Put in. He had a kidney oh. transplant. But that he would literally was like feel himself in. dying and and feel the defibrillator like coming in and shocking his heart and getting it back wow. up. It was His crazy. health was a mess. But yeah. you know, some people have that, like the no will to live, the no will to get better. The He had no, he's such an interesting, per he was such an interesting personality. He had no will to get better because in many ways he was addicted to his pain and his sickness because that was Because of the attention. attention. Mm. He was a victim personality. He needed attention. And when there wasn't anything wrong with him, he would make something up. And so therefore he would continue to manifest illness and, and hard, like he had some hard shit happen in his life for sure. 
But it's because he made no effort to make it better. It was always someone else's And then it was very hard at that point to, when something was actually going wrong with him or he was really feeling something for you to to really him. believe it or trust it because it was, was like you say this off. all day every day what makes it any different this time that like you know your your shoulders are feeling stiffer I had my dad and out of breath tell me and... many times that he was going to take his own life um because i didn't love him enough mm. um because i abandoned him um this is coming from the man that when i was a teenager would tell me i've never spoken about this stuff he would tell me that I was a uh, pathetic waste of space that would never amount to anything. Um, this was in the period of time where I wasn't dancing because I'd hurt my knee. Um, there's just so much of a relationship there and I tried so hard over the years to make it better, but I just never could. And that's the, I can't, my, for my whole life with him, I just could not make it better. Wow. No matter what avenue I took, um, what is the, the nurturing him, the pushing him, the cutting him off, the cutting him out, the, the, the loving him, the trying to talk about going to therapy with him, nothing. None of it worked because there was no accountability. And when I would try and bring up our, our history and our past pain, he would just simply say that it never happened. And so it was, at, at the end of the day, it was more painful for me to try and find resolution with him. I had to find peace within myself that he did the best with the tools that he had and he had his own journey and I had to let go of that. But I, I had this new hope when falling pregnant mm, that mm -hmm. maybe we could move on from this. Maybe our history can just sit there and not matter. And you can be a granddad because you'd be an amazing granddad. And it wasn't enough for him to take better care of himself and him coming and passing here. Like that grieving period was, so complicated. Um, I was very angry at him. I uh, found a lot of messages and emails on his phone of things that he was saying to people at home while he was in our house. Um, about, about you? About me, about us. Oh, it must be nice to live um, with all of this. You can't even help your dad out. Um, making me out to be this villain that I just wasn't. And uh, it was really painful. So when he passed, it was a really painful, uh, a really difficult grieving period. And it has been for the time. I think only in the last like month and a half have I said that I have found peace with him. You've had I've conversations with him. I've had conversations with him. That's going to make me emotional. Um, thanking him for what I could. Thanking him for choosing my mum. Uh, thanking him for being my biggest supporter with dance. Even though we had a very complicated relationship with other things, dance was the one thing that always brought us together. Um, I wouldn't be in America dancing if it wasn't for him being my, my number one fan and supporting me through mm. that. If that was the case, I wouldn't have met Bri. I wouldn't have Zayn. My life would be completely different. If, you know, he chose my mum. Their lives came together. She is a light and a strength in my world. She inspires me all the time. I love her deeply. She's my best friend. Uh, there's a, so much that he gave me that I found the ability to say thank you for those things um, and to know that he did the very best that he could and I am who I am because of him and even because of the hard stuff and the pain because I had to work through my shit to be able to find an amazing man. Mm -hmm. You know, I dated many men like my dad over and over and over again. And I went through that healing period too, uh, to be able to find a man that is the way he is and that loves me the way he loves me and that is a father the way he is a father. I only got to this beautiful, blissful point because I had to work through all of that. So mm -hmm. I have found deep gratitude um, for him. I, mean, I was triggered even when people would say that Zane looked like him. Mm -hmm. Like it upset wow. me. Wow. Yeah. I You're like, he's not going to be anything like him. him. Mm -hmm. And now, now I love that. Now I'm okay with that because I, uh, I believe that he's going to heal from this lifetime and, and get, you know, move on to the next and hopefully have another chance at finding everything he couldn't find in this one. Uh, and I wish him, his soul, the absolute most mm. and the best with that. Uh, and I have gratitude for the, what he did give me. The good, the bad, and the ugly. 
Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for shit. Wow. <laughs> I didn't think to share. I've never really shared much about my yeah. life with my dad um, because it's hard mm -hmm. uh, and it's complicated. And I think I'm still trying to figure out my words on how to share it. But do you think I can clear something around that? Yeah, I would like that because I think it. it's funny how when we can, it started out with with intrusive thoughts around Zane, and then clearly this is the thing that wants to be brought up. For, for a clearing and I think I'll stick with emotions because those are felt like when we're putting out a broadcast message of I can't or whatever other people start responding differently toward us because we're now not broadcasting that out but with emotions it's something that you're feeling so this is the one that you actually feel lighter not carrying it anymore yeah so is there anything around dad yeah in poem a odd row, row one abandonment so the first thing is abandonment mm -hmm. so first feeling that comes up before the age of 20 before 15 before 10 before Five after five, five, six, seven, just for Sharna. So something happened at age seven that made you feel abandoned by dad. Could even be, is this resonating? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you want to share it? Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> my dad, uh, my mom and dad split many times, but one of the most uh, obvious times was when I was around six or seven years old. And uh, my dad was my hero at that point. I had no idea really who he was. And so I remember he made my mom out to be the villain, um, which was really difficult, but I lived with my mom at the time. And so I remember feeling like, where is he when mm. he wasn't around, um, which was difficult. But I think there's the feeling of abandonment that I don't know if this is part of it, but the fact that he said that I abandoned him is also very difficult for me to process. Yeah. It's, it's all ties in together and there was also as you were explaining that I also cleared self-abuse that came up also from age seven Self-abuse is negative self-talk being hard on yourself So it's funny that you say that because that I I cleared self-abuse as you were explaining and then you said he blamed me for abandoning So I think the self-abuse comes from him telling you at that point probably that it's your fault or you somehow Thinking it's my fault. Mm. I thought I was an early child. Mm -hmm. I absolutely thought it was my fault like I could fix it like I had done something wrong. Um, obviously, you grow up and you know that's not true, but sometimes that little six-year-old still lives within you and uh, and can move you, you know, yeah. make decisions for you and, and bring up a lot of things. I'll just do one more just for the sake of time and then we can always do more off camera, but I want to clear anything that, or not anything, one thing um, that you inherited from your dad. That way we give a little gift to him wherever he is now. We'll clear it from him too. If Zane inherited it, if any of your, oh, you don't have siblings. Wherever it is from the line, it's just cut. So let's see, can we clear the biggest inherited emotion? That's a block for Sharna right now that she inherited from dad. Is it in So shocking because it would not be something I think from somebody who's a pro dancer, but it's creative insecurity. No, I get creative insecurity all the time. 30 30. And this one's from before 30, before 25, after 25, after 30, before 30, 25, 26. So this one's from age 27. There might be another one that's from age 27 that wants to come up, but is this inherited creative from dad? Insecurity is, an is this created from dad? Yeah, so there's one at 27. Yeah. Let me clear that first. Wow. And then there might be one from dad. Did we clear that creative insecurity? Good. Is there another creative insecurity inherited from dad? Yeah. Does it go back further than dad? No. Can we clear it? Okay. And then there's also one from dad, so we'll clear that too. So since we're clearing it from dad, I'm just going to do a few more swipes. Ooh. Crazy. And this is like super mini, but the, you know, because when I, when I work with people, we're doing 30 minutes an hour, so there's so much we clear. You might feel something with a few uh, emotions being cleared. I had one woman who, she had restless leg syndrome, so her legs would constantly yeah, shake. Constantly you know, yeah, constantly. Always. Yeah. And we did five minutes because we were live on stage at a workshop I was doing in Costa Rica. So I'm like, I don't know if you're gonna benefit. You know, my sessions are an hour, this is five minutes, but like, let's see. And it's been three months. She's a nurse in California, uh, has not had it since. And she's had it since she was 19. She's now 42. Wow. wow that's so five cool. minutes, you never know, could yeah. happen. Yeah. But uh, yeah, is there anything, Brian, you wanna work on? <laughs> I, is there anything that comes up? That yeah, yeah. Why don't we clear? Let's do it. Let's clear. Yeah. Let's do something around the heart. All right. Um, okay. Am I able to test for Brian? Yeah. Is there anything that we? Does Brian have a heart wall? Yeah. Are there more than three? 
there's more than 30 emotions around your heart while less than 35. So these are emotions alone that are just around the heart, c creating a protection, a wall of protection. Okay. So we're not going to clear all 30, but we'll see. Well, well, <laughs> I can. Understandably. <laughs> but we'll see what comes yeah. up. Can we clear the heart wall? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So the first thing is grief. How old are you now? I, I turned 50 this year. 49. Oh, right before, 45. oh, before you're 49 now. Yeah, before 45, actually 45, 45, 46, 47. This grief is from 47. And I can always find out if you want more information what it is. Okay. Um, would you like to know that? Or do you know what it is? Oh, okay. A lot of, yeah. I mean, I can only imagine that it was just <laughs> everything going on when I was 47. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also indecisiveness before 45, after 45, 45, 46, but also at 47. Is this related? They're related to each other. We're going to clear the indecisiveness. We can move pretty fast. What's that? All the same stuff. Ah, yeah. And there's also, this is, okay, so this one goes back. This is inherited. Is this inherited from mom, from dad? Does it go back further than dad? Is it confusion? It's defensiveness okay. from dad. You know more yeah. to clear it. Okay. <laughs> Does that resonate? It's pretty yeah. understandable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One, two, three, four, five. Conflict, creating severity, terror. Feeling unsupported before 40, after 40, after 45, 45, Young. 40, at 46. 46. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can tell you who it's related to, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Sure. Yeah, to be clear, that isn't more here. All me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get through all yeah. 30. <laughs> I know. I don't want to stop. I get into it. Um, stubbornness as well. Okay. So Sharna will like that we go to this one. <laughs> very stubborn. Very stubborn. Yeah. Stubborn. After, 30, after 30, after 35, after 40, before 40, 35, 36, 37. So this one's from age 37. There could be multiple. This one, that's around the heart, 37. Okay. And we can clear it. Sometimes we need to know more. We don't need to so far with any of these. Most, yeah, most of the stuff that happened around that age, I'm... Um, At 37? Yeah, yeah. You know what it is? Yeah. 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 So then the next one is guilt, feeling guilt before the age of 40, before 35, after 35, 35, 36, also 37. I was, yeah, I was, I was going through, um, I just had a crazy, I had a, it ended up being uh, like a, uh, have being allergic to gluten and dairy and things that I had been doing in my life, but I, I went through a health period where I went from ulcerative colitis that they couldn't really diagnose, it wasn't the normal um, symptoms, to then vertigo that they couldn't really diagnose, to then I had a total neurological breakdown. Shutdown. My My brain and my body completely disconnected. That took four and a half years to recover from. But like he couldn't speak. Whoa. Speech therapy, Whoa. physical Whoa. therapy, I Whoa. Had to do everything. He had to leave I shuffled like was I was. I shuffled couldn't. like I was ninety. Like yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't say more than one word in like thirty seconds. Wow. Um, it was. Terrible. That was around that age, thirty-seven. It it really started kicking in around that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was when, if you don't mind me sharing on your behalf, mm. like he couldn't spend as much time with Cash. He right. and Megan had been very involved in Cassius's yeah. life, traveling with him and doing all the things. Very yeah. involved parents. But then when he got sick, mm. he couldn't barely get out of bed. So Cash was living um, at his mom's house off of uh, Laurel Canyon. Um, and I was, at the point when it really started affecting me, I was, we were renting a house in like Brentwood, so it was far. I couldn't, not only could I not drive, I couldn't get up out of bed, I, could, I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything. Wow. So I went from being a real active parent in his life to just physically and mentally, I had such brain fog at that point that um, I remember one of the like classic stories for me was Trey. Scott. Scott. One of my best friends in the world uh, named Scott. He's, he's been my friend for... 30 plus years now and he's known my sister just as long and I reintroduced him to my sister at that uh, time like, at that time in case they hadn't met wow I was like oh Scott you've met my sister Lorelai right and he was like that was when he and her realized how severe the brain fog was for me 
that it just couldn't, I, I just couldn't get off the blocks. How did that get figured out? Um, the doctor, the, the guy that does uh, kinesiology, Dr. Burns. Yeah, he, he was. He did a full uh, cellular detox, um, changed up everything, and really start. I mean, originally before him, I was just having to, um, uh, like, do therapies and things and treat it uh, like someone that had a stroke would. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't have a stroke, I had had two MRIs at that point. I had no physical sign of any damage, anything. And it wasn't, uh, normally strokes are immediate. People wake up in the morning, they had a stroke at night when they were in bed, and it's like, right away, you know you had a stroke. This was a slow mm. oncoming thing, and it was just like progressing slowly. Gradually and deteriorating. It went from little things I was noticing when I was driving, like oversteering, and then I noticed that I was slurring words here and there, and it just got progressively worse to the point where um, I, like you wouldn't believe it. I, I literally couldn't do anything. Yeah. I had yeah. um, a, a friend of mine that does acupuncture, he was coming out, and we were just working on just simple movements just to keep my body moving because I couldn't, everything was so tense, I couldn't straighten my arm completely because of the, the resistance from it all. Um, so that was just a huge time, and that was a huge time for my relationship with Cash because uh, he knew me better than anybody, so I was so insecure with him because I knew, you know, as you start healing from things, you feel like, okay, well, people, the appearance is people think I'm better. Like I've, I've gotten better from it. But you know, like if you hurt your ankle, everybody's like, oh, your ankle's feeling better. But you know, like, no, I don't walk yeah. the same right now. My ankle still hurts. I just figured out how to walk on it where people don't think something's wrong with my ankle all the time. It's the same thing with my neurological stuff. But I knew that he knew me so well that I couldn't pull any of those over on him so it made me really insecure being around him because I knew like, oh, he's going to hear me speak. He's going to mm. see me do things. He's going to see little things. And he's so um, aware of who I am because I've spent so much time with him that he's going to see right through it right away. And then what the fuck am I going to do? Mm -hmm. like, As a dad, I think you always want to be strong. You know what I mean? You can't yeah, you want to be... Especially if you're, like you were saying, love language is service. Like, yes. I like to serve in order to show my love, right? Yeah. You're offering things. Yeah. Yeah. You know there was also, when you started that, was self-abuse at age 17 came up. And I cleared that. That was when 90210 started. Oh, you were that young? I was 17. Okay, so there's self-abuse. So probably being... That was from 1990 to 2000. You went through a lot of stuff with that. I was, person. well, I, I grew up on a show that was watched by, you know, 80% of the planet at that point. Um, wow. So during, during your most formidable years when most kids want to like sort of disappear a little bit and go through their growth and experiences, I was doing that in front of everyone. 17. 17. 17 to 27. I was, I was on RFC1 now. So self-abuse makes sense. Let's clear one more thing from that time period. Is there anything else from that time period? Yeah, in column A, column B. Anything else from the show specifically? Okay, column A, column B. See, this is so interesting to me. This is why I love doing this, because this is the last thing I would think, that you would have creative insecurity, that yours, what's coming up now, is insecurity as well. So self-abuse oh, yeah. and insecurity. We think great-looking guy on yeah. the biggest show in the world, insecurity. Such insecurity. I remember at one point... Um, I had to work with my therapist because I would have an issue even going into like Starbucks and ordering a drink and looking someone in the eye as I was doing it because my first thought was, oh, they're judging me. Mm -hmm. I look at him and they're going to go, oh, it's him. Oh, he's, you know, I hated him. When, like, I, or, oh, that's what he drinks? I yeah. immediately <laughs> you went know, to like that place. Like. Yeah, yeah. So I had to like uh, reprogram the way I thought and realize like, oh, there's somebody behind the counter at a place like that. They have so much of their own shit going on. Like the last thing that they're thinking of is, oh, this guy, I don't like his, 
you know, his scene from this episode. Because like, he's probably thinking, the breeze is probably thinking, what is he thinking of right. me? Right. Oh, he's, For yeah, sure. he's. This big actor, oh. this whatever's coming in, and he's, what does he think I am? Right. He thinks I'm just a barista. Like, yeah, right. he's having his own exactly. narrative. Yeah, I thought yeah. he's a barista. He's on a massive TV It was show. big for me because it was, it was a real, I've always had a, a very strong moral compass as far as um, really, I see everybody the same way I see myself. I don't see myself as any more than or less than anybody else. I treat everyone equally. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a big moment for me because I really believed that. Like I, I always had the moral compass for it and I always, um, it always rang true to me and felt true. So I didn't falsely do that, but I don't know if I believed it um, on as deep a level as you possibly could. Mm. And, and now I finally do. I feel like, no, we are, everyone is the same. Everyone's experience is different and their life is different and they're going through different things, but we're all human beings at the end of it. So I, mm. I, I wouldn't want anyone to feel like I treated them any differently than anybody else would. Mm -hmm. um, and just truly like, found that and believe that to my core. I can talk to you guys all day. So thank you so much for this. Seriously. <laughs> really you. beautiful. Thank you. You're so beautiful. Thank you for that. That, yeah, was, that, was, that was amazing. Of course, yeah. Really cool. We can go further anytime you want. Um, one thing that I do in every episode is that I've been giving away two books. Uh, one book to two viewers. Somebody who's listening on the podcast app and somebody who's watching uh -huh. uh, the video on YouTube. So um, do you guys have, we can even do two different books. Is there one book you've both been reading or that has in the past changed your life so much? When you were in that, when you were in the hills and creating your vision board and putting it, was it, it wasn't necessarily a book, honestly, at that point. Like, I love, love reading. Mm. Um, but I fell in love with uh, Abraham Hicks. Do you know Yeah, Hicks? yeah, totally. Yeah. So my mom introduced me to Abraham years ago and I was not ready for the concept of it. Mm. I was like, eh, mm -hmm. eh, that's mm -hmm. a bit much. And then it came back into my world and I would just listen to... Uh, Abraham's uh, videos on YouTube, people asking questions and, you know, and then answering. And it was, it was unbelievable. The more I listened, the more I understood truly mm. this idea of energy in the vortex and spirit and um, the power of intention, the law of attraction, the, all these different things. And I just listened to them over and over again until it truly sunk in this idea of it. And it truly, even now I will listen to Abraham. I yeah. will just, and it's so crazy and it's so very Abraham how whatever I'm going through at the moment or whatever question I have, I will just open up YouTube and because it's my most favorite thing I watch, I get all these options and I'll just tap on the first one or I'll scroll and tap and that's the one that plays and mm. it brings me something that I need in that moment or in that day. So there's been books, Untethered Soul, Power of Now. There's but Abraham Hicks and Esrix has a book. Have a book. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So we'll just, I will, I'll give one of their books away. Okay. Yeah. And I then what about you, Brian? I'm not, I'm not a, but she's a reader. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I, I so like, we can because I'm so OC, wow. because I'm so ADD, it's hard for me to read and get through books completely. I, I'll start reading a book and it will, um, like trigger something and inspire something and then I'll put it down and then I'll get mm -hmm. into something just in my own life yeah, and yeah. therapy or whatever. I think. The one that inspired me a lot, though, was the Four Agreements when I was young. Yeah, oh, yeah. somebody else suggested that as well. Yes. Cool. Yeah, just because it, it really... Love Languages, you've read that one. Yeah, J yeah just the, the... I mean, I'm sure there are a million other books, too. Honestly, the ones for me uh, were just anything that sort of took me out of myself and that selfish space and, and forced me to look in a broader mm. way. Four Agreements is a great one. Four Agreements is wonderful, yeah. yeah. So why don't we do what I'm going to, this is the way we've been doing it, is if you're watching on YouTube, then just put in the comment section any of those two. So it can be Abraham Hicks, just write in Abraham Hicks or Four Agreements. Yeah. Yep. We're going to pick one person from the comments, send them a book, 
And then if you're listening on the podcast app or Spotify, whatever it is, just rate the podcast, five stars preferably. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> give it five. Give it five. Definitely. <laughs> Carry on and Alba, 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and then uh, just screen grab that, send it oh, to me, wanna... make sure I see it, and we'll send you uh, one of those books as well. And that's it. Dude, you guys, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Really you. lovely. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs>